You are listening to Why I Vaccinate. I'm Ann Thomas. I'm here with my co-host, Veronica McNally. And our next guest is Linda Vale. She is the health officer with the Ingham County Health Department. And she's here with us to continue this conversation about having the tough conversation about vaccinations and keeping the community safe. Welcome to the show, Linda. Well, thank you so much for having me here. So Linda, it's kind of a tough time right now, very trying time yeah. to be a health officer in the state of Michigan. Talk a little bit about the work that you're doing to keep the community healthy. Well, you know, it kind of spans a whole lot of things, everything from just keeping people informed about what's going on, um, watching trends, um, working with vaccinations, as well as contact tracing, case investigation, you know, trying really to contain COVID um, outside of, you know, vaccine being our most effective mechanism to contain and, and to stop the spread of COVID. But, you know, we do know that we're just now uh, vaccinating five to 11 year olds. And so the, the tried and true public health strategies of identifying cases, isolation, quarantine of those who have been exposed, but who are not yet ill is basically, you know, a containment strategy and is one of the best ones we've had. Now, of course, we learned with COVID that one of the other things we can do is wear masks. Uh, lots of controversy about that. I'm going to tell you that, you know, people will say even on the box, it says that that mask is not going to um, block a virus from coming in. And that is correct. But the fact is, is the mask is about source control. So this mask is really about covering my face. And if I were COVID positive, blocking particles, whether they be large ones, which we call droplets, or the very small ones, which we call aerosols, from actually coming out and affecting other people. It minimizes that distance and potentially also minimizes what we call the viral inoculum. In other words, it will bring down the number of virus particles that might actually get out. So, and then the wearer does have some minimal protection as well on the other side. So all of this talk about masks don't uh, block the virus from coming in it is not an understanding of what these masks are for. So that is what the masks are for. Oh, that's so interesting. So in your job, you see a lot of families. They come to the health department for mm -hmm. information and advice. What are you seeing? What are they saying? How are they feeling? Well, you know, some are just, you know, we, we had our first clinic with our five to 11 year olds last, uh, I think it was Wednesday. And, you know, th that was another one of those just wonderful moments in public health. It was one of those times when, you know, the people who were there that day have been so anxious and have been waiting for so long to get their kids vaccinated and the relief, the overwhelming feelings of joy. I mean, I saw tears. I saw lots of thank yous. I've gotten, you know, emails from some of these folks afterwards. But, you know, parents talking about being able to get together over the holidays now with their 90 some year old um, parents who are the grandparents of these young children who haven't been able to be vaccinated. And they're feeling this sense of, we can gather as a family, everything in, you know, in a multi-generational way and not put our older family members at risk or even other family members. I, I ran into an individual whose uh, father was involved in clinical trials um, at Cleveland Clinic. And I don't know whether that was related to cancer or something like that, but it's a family that was having to be very careful, stay in most of the time because a younger child still needed to be vaccinated to help protect this vulnerable family member. So there was a lot of that. Um, and then there's a lot of other questions. So let's kind of go into the other questions. Right. How are you dealing with the people that come to you with misinformation? They've, they've been online and they're following the wrong site and they just are really misinformed about this. How do you deal with that, Linda? That is a tough one because a lot of that stuff has been out there in such ways and has been propagated. Much of it, I would say, is beyond misinformation. It's flat out disinformation. And um, it's really challenging to get people to budge out of those places so, you know, one of the things you hear is we don't know what the long term effects of this are going to be. Well, you have to understand a vaccine versus other kinds of medications. Long term effects from a vaccine are likely to happen within the first two months, because unlike a medication that you're on all the time, 
where, you know, we might learn years down the road that this medication that was coursing through your system all the time has a long-term effect. If it was a new one, a vaccine goes into your body. Um, the inert ingredients are things that your body has been exposed to many, many, many times. The mRNA itself, which is what causes the immune response, then basically goes in. It falls apart fairly quickly too. All the rest of what happens in your body is your own immune system. There are no long-term effects of your own immune system doing its job. So what you're saying, Linda, is there's nothing that's going into your body that's going to be destructive for the long-term. This vaccine is designed to stimulate the immune response to fight COVID. That is correct, as is the case with you know all, all vaccines. They stimulate your immune response. So, you know, it, it's just a different way of looking at things when you start talking about, well, what about long-term effects? What about, what are we gonna find out 10 years from now about this? That's just really a false sense of what a vaccine is and how it works. And Veronica, I know you've got some questions for Linda Vale too. Linda, I wanna talk to you about um, the parents who bring their kids in and they're not opposed to vaccination, but they have some questions. How do you um, interact with those parents and how do you talk to your um, other people doing providing support in your clinic? How do they deal with them as well? You know, I think the best thing to do is to meet people where they are. Um, so you understand what, what, what their concerns are. Um, you try to walk through those concerns. And, and in the very end, many, many times, the best advice to give them is, please have a conversation with your pediatrician. If you have concerns, you know, we hear allergy concerns. There's not a lot in these vaccines that create allergies. Um, we hear about fertility and pregnancy, clearly not with children, but you know, that has been something that has been dispelled as well. Um, and, and so we just have to walk through a lot of those different concerns, acknowledge them to some extent because they're there. You know, they're there, they've been said, they've heard them multiple times. So understand why they are con continuing to ask these questions and then just try to have conversations about what the reality is, what the science and the facts say, and then move forward. And then, you know, if you're really dealing with somebody who's still you know, really concerned, then really honestly, the best place for them is to have a conversation with their pediatrician. And what I always say is, do not hesitate or think that you are bothering your pediatrician by wanting to have this conversation with them. So do you find that parents have questions about the flu vaccine more than let's say other vaccines that their kids are going to get? Um, not really, um, not a lot of questions about flu vaccine, except I think what we see with flu vaccine is a sense that younger people don't need it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you go to our really young ones, which are most at risk for, you know, adverse effects with flu, you know, are really young and are really old. Um, and, and we're protecting them by vaccinating around them since they can't get vaccinated until six months. But as we move into those, younger years, adolescent years, and even into their 20s, there's just kind of this thought that, you know, it's the flu and I don't need a vaccine. And again, I think we lose sight of a very important part of vaccines. And one is, is that that vaccine is to protect yourself. And you know, just as well as, as you know better, actually, than most people, uh, Veronica, that that vaccine is not just about that. That vaccine is about creating a ring of protection around those who either can't get vaccinated or are particularly vulnerable. So when a baby is born and can't get a flu vaccine, when a baby is born and can't get a Tdap vaccine for that pertussis, then what's really, really critical is that those parents are vaccinated, that other family members are vaccinated, that the people that are gonna be around them and caring for them are vaccinated so that there's a barrier between this infant, this child, and this virus being able to get to them. You provide essentially a, you know, a, a barrier and that's so very critical. And that you know, really is part of that herd immunity conversation. We need enough people vaccinated around the vulnerable in our population who either are gonna have waning immunity or who are um, unable to be vaccinated for legitimate medical reasons. And then we have an obligation socially to vaccinate around them to the extent that they're not at risk. So, yeah. So for those um, 
listeners who don't know about the schedule for the influenza vaccine, can you talk about when an, a baby can start to become vaccinated and, and how if a parent needs to catch up their child, when and how they can do that? So um, we start vaccinating babies at six months for influenza. And, you know, in terms of a catch up schedule, that really is based on at, at any point in time when somebody shows up. So, you know, if you are behind, we're going to get that vaccine and then we're going to continue to go through the schedule as it is. So a delayed vaccine just just means, OK, we, we missed this one by a couple of months. Let's start right now and then let's keep moving forward. So I like to think of the phrase better late than never. Right. For these families exactly. who have to get their kids caught up. So when, when a parent comes in and they have questions, where do you refer them? If, if obviously you have some materials there, but where else do you tell them to go so they get good information? Uh, you know, my tried and true sources of information are the CDC, the state health department, our health department, the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, and, and your own pediatrician. And all of those organizations are recommending the COVID vaccine for kids 5 to 11. Uh, obviously, we've been vaccinating adolescents for a bit longer here. But what can you say to parents about the importance of getting that vaccine? The vaccine is available for 5 to 11. It's safe and effective. We know that. We've shown that. Um, we've got a few things going on. One is, is that while we know that children are very low risk for severe COVID, while we know that children are very, very low risk for dying from COVID, we do know that children can get COVID. And there are a couple of things that are important about that. One is, what is the impact on that child? Mm -hmm. We do know that we have lost over 600 children in the United States to COVID. Um, as you know, if that's your child, that matters. If that's my granddaughter, my children, that matters. Any life we can save is worth saving, especially if it's preventable. Preventable deaths, no matter how many there are, and there are far fewer deaths from a lot of other things that we vaccinate for already as a standard childhood immunization. Fewer deaths in those circumstances. I think hepatitis B might be one of them. Um, but more deaths with COVID. Why wouldn't we be vaccinated if we're vaccinating for these other things? So it protects that child from the potential of these serious consequences. About 70% of children who end up with multi-system inflammatory syndrome end up in the ICU. Um, we know that children also can have long COVID and we don't yet know what is long COVID um, going to do? How is it gonna affect people neurologically and how long really will it last? So we're talking about potential long-term effects as well. So we do want to protect our children, even though we know the risk is low, because anything preventable in terms of a death is worth preventing. The next thing is those children are part of the transmission in our community. Yeah. About 25% of our cases right now are between the ages of zero and 17. We have lots of cases. We're soaring back up again, which means we have a lot of community transmission, which means they're contributing to community transmission, when we contribute to community transmission, we're affecting everything. We're affecting hospitalizations. We're affecting things that are going on a lot of other places. And what we're doing is potentially exposing vulnerable family members or vulnerable community members via transmission going on with children. Linda, this is just such great advice. We really appreciate it. And I really loved your advice about meeting people where they are and trying to remain calm and just give them the information. Are you feeling like that is effective and you are trying to keep people calm and it's working? Oh, absolutely. For people who have concerns, um, you know, who really are just like, I, I believe in vaccinations. I've watched all of this go out. I, I might be vaccinated myself, but when it comes to my children, you know, then there's this little concern, meeting people sure. where they are. There certainly are some people out there and we all know it, at this point in time that are just not movable. They're right. believing in conspiracy theories and things that are just just pat patently false. Right. And, and it's very difficult to get through to that. But when you're with somebody who's not in that space and you can have a conversation with and deal with questions and concerns, fears, whatever, then, then you have some place to move. Linda Vale, health officer with the Ingham County Health Department. Thank you for your time today. It was really nice to meet you and to speak with you. Thank you so much. Take care, Linda. Thanks for everything you're doing. You are listening to Why I Vaccinate. We'll be back right after this.